Thanks, Matt. Uh, John chapter 5. And I'll probably be, I'll, I'll be in John chapter 5 this morning and this evening. I thought maybe I'd get through it better if I started this morning and kept going till the evening, but I, I figure we'll probably have a break in between. <clears throat> I, I need, and each of us need, uh, to see Jesus, to so see Jesus that everything else pales into insignificance. We've been following his walk in this gospel, and, and the door has been opening and the light has been entering in. And so Christ in the Gospel of John has had a number of encounters with people and not all of them are recorded here. The Gospel says that the ones that are recorded are recorded for a specific purpose. They're recorded that we might believe that he's the Son of God and believing we might have life in his name. That's why these are recorded. And in John chapter 5 is a critical encounter His disciples, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the nobleman, have all been getting a glimpse of who Jesus is. Some have called him the Messiah, the Son of God. Some, the King of Israel, the Christ. But I don't think the import of that has hit anybody yet. And when we come to John chapter 5, what starts to happen is that the word that we met in John chapter 1 starts to reveal himself as God in the flesh. In John chapter 5, we start to see not only is he the chosen one of God, as if he were another prophet. Not only could he heal, not only could he declare words of wisdom that were just beyond, beyond us, but he was a man who, calling God his father, was equal with God. He was someone that we should honour even as we honour the father, it says. Now just think about that. This is the incomparable Jesus. We don't have anyone else in history to match him against, to compare him with. Now we do compare him with. And people talk about him flippantly. And even as Christians we talk about him maybe in terms overly familiar. I don't know. I know we have a relationship of love with him, but, but we can bring him down to our level, can't we? And when I do that, then all my difficulties in life and all the tragedies and all my struggles, whatever they are, <laughs> elevate. They become greater. Because I don't see Jesus as he is. St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote these words, and I I love these words. You know that I like them because I've quoted them often. Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast, but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. So we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus not just as a man, not just as the one who was called the Son of God. We want to see him as God incarnate. And as we'll see as we travel through, it was this one who not only is our God, but he's our saviour. Let's just pray before we look at the word. Heavenly Father, um, forgive us for for not um, honouring you as we should. It's evident. 
We're thankful for your mercies to us. We thank you that you're a God who is good. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who, uh, above all things in heaven and earth, should stoop and take upon himself the form of a servant and fashion himself as a man to engage with a broken and a fallen humanity. We thank you for your love and Lord we just ask that you open our eyes and our hearts uh, that we might see Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. So that the chapter structurally is, is, is fairly simple. There's a, an encounter in uh, verses 1 to 8 where Jesus uh, demonstrates his compassion for the sick. There's a conflict with the, the Pharisees. Um, and Jesus chose to do this on the Sabbath. Uh, later in John chapter 9, he chooses to, to do a healing on the Sabbath. That creates uh, a critical element, a confrontation. And then, in, uh, then it goes on in verses 18 to 29 where Jesus clearly and explicitly and unequivocally is the word, uh, pronounces his claim, his claim to be working with the Father, co-workers with God the Father, his claim to be the authority and the source of life and his claim to be the judge. And then the chapter finishes off because this causes a great deal of consternation, as it would <laughs> if anybody just made these claims, but, but it closes off with a confirmation, a, a, a witness, a testimony, a demonstration that in fact these claims that any of us could make, <laughs> we'd be called madmen if we did. But when he made them and finishes off in a way that confirms and settles and shows that these were no idle claims. In anybody else, they would be akin to blasphemy. They would be blasphemy. In fact, this is why the Jewish folk, uh, the Pharisees, wanted to stone him. That was the accusa accusation. He was making himself equal with God. But the chapter closes so that there's no doubt in our minds that the claims that Jesus is making in this chapter have a foundation, that the claims that he makes are true, that unlike anybody else, the claims that he makes here are claims that can be substantiated. And so you could see why this chapter is here in the purpose of the book. Because remember, John is writing, he's saying, I'm writing these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's about a belief in who he is and believing you might have life in his name. So as we go, it just it settles us. It helps us to understand what our faith is and where it rests. It really is about a person, and we say that, but it really is about a person. It settles upon Christ. Apart from him, there is nothing else. There is nothing else. And every one of those problems that I talked about at the beginning pales into insignificance when we can see Jesus in this way. So let's see him. It begins in verse 1. Now he had come, um, the previous chapter, he, had, he was back in Galilee, in Cana, uh, and we'd read how he'd come from Jerusalem and went through Samaria and he came into Cana and he's been ministering all the time. So remember, these are snippets of his ministry. Right? It's not the whole story. And then now we're back in Jerusalem in chapter 5. So he's come to Jerusalem as he was doing regularly and uh, it tells us that there was a feast of the Jews and in fact we know it was a Sabbath day and um, he comes to a place which is variously called Bethesda or Bethsaida um, where there was a pool of sorts and some 
uh, some covering, porches, colonnades, call them what you will. And he comes here and there's a, it says a great multitude. So there's a lot of people. And Jesus sees one. Now this is, this is a fascinating thing, isn't it? That in the multitude, Jesus can see one. But he sees everyone. <laughs> it's the wonder of it all. And, and here, and he saw everybody else. There's no question. And one of the questions we're going to raise when we look at this is, is why did he only heal this person? Right, that's an interesting question. Why did he only heal this man? But he did. He, he came here in the purpose and the work of God. So this was not an accident. It was not an accident when he went through Samaria. It was not an accident that they went back to Cana. Remember, the sick boy was in Capernaum when the nobleman came to him. But he came to Cana and he healed this man at a distance. There wasn't an accident. So he's walking uh, a divine path. He's walking in the purposes and will of God. And that's no different to us, really. We have divine encounters. We have divine opportunities. If I, if I really believe that God is the sovereign Lord over all, then surely I must believe that everything that occurs, he allows and he purposes and he's working. It says that he works everything for the believer for our good. All things work together for good. And so this is not an accidental encounter. It's part and parcel of the purpose of God. And I would say none of our encounters are accidental. Some of them are annoying. <laughs> Some of them are inconvenient. Some of them are downright painful and tragic and difficult. But they're not accidental. They're not accidental. And Jesus comes to this place and there's this, mul I don't know what number multitude is, but it's clearly communicating that there were lots of people here. And it seems that they had this impression and various people read this in a different way, but, but my understanding here is that the, the impression was that these people thought that there was something special about the water or that region, so that, um, so that uh, at certain times the belief was that an angel would come and stir the waters and first one then gets it. <laughs> now, I, I don't know whether this whether there was some divine element, there well could have been, or whether this was just uh, the, the impression or maybe even the superstition, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's clear that this person, this man, thought that if he was going to get healed, it had to be <laughs> to jump into the water somehow. But there was a problem because he, he couldn't walk. Right? He couldn't, he couldn't do anything to help himself. And so Jesus um, encounters him and, and um, he says to him in verse, and we read this, um, he, he sees him and he says to him, do you want to be healed? Now remember, Jesus knows this man. This man doesn't know Jesus. We know he doesn't know Jesus because later when the, when the Pharisee says, who was it? He said, I've got no idea. It was just somebody. It was somebody coming through. He clearly wasn't one of the... There were certain people that knew something about Jesus. They knew this person was going around performing miracles and that. But this, this man evidently didn't know. The nobleman knew something special about Jesus. He approached him. He asked Jesus to heal his son but this man didn't recognise who he was and Jesus calls him and he says will you be made whole now this man was lame for 38 years I cannot imagine what that would be like uh, it doesn't, doesn't tell us whether he was born that way or how old he was but, but for 38 years he's been in this condition no social security, no support in that sense. We don't know. Perhaps he had some degree of family support. Uh, 
but he was existing. I don't think he was a very happy man. You know, I think he was, he was at the point where he's struggling. And, and, and we all have our struggles. We do. And it's, it's easy either to dis- miss other people's struggles, as if they don't matter, because we don't have the compassion of Jesus, but we should. Or else um, we, in our struggles, just get so overwhelmed and it seems as if this is just the way it is. We, there is no hope. And this man was probably not inspired with a great deal of hope. Nothing much to look forward to. Don't know what his um, belief was, whether he, he had a sense of eternity or a future. But here he was, someone in need. And Jesus comes to see You know that Jesus has compassion. Isn't that a wonderful thought? In Matthew chapter 9, it it tells us that he... Let let me just read it. It, It's just a, a lovely phrase, and these days I keep forgetting things. Um... When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. So he comes here, Jesus comes with a sense of compassion um, in the purpose of God because there are things going to happen. <laughs> this is going to be a remarkable, remarkable event. But as far as a man's concerned, he's got compassion on him. And he asks, asks him this question, do you, do you want to be healed? And um, uh, what would you say? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that, that, that we, we, we have in our own minds, all of us, how God's going to work? Now, as soon as this man was asked about would he be healed, he wasn't thinking, well, God's, God can do something here. He was thinking about, right, if God's going to heal me, what's going to have to happen is somehow or another he's going to have to get me to the pool. Right, and I do this all the time. I'm sure we do it all the time. You know, if God's going to resolve this situation, the way He's going to resolve it, He's going to fix this, yep, or He's going to give me some more money, (laughs) or He's going to provide me with this job. Or I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for these things or pray through these needs. If this man was going to articulate his prayer, it probably would have been, Lord, when the waters move, help me get into them. But that's not what he needed. He didn't really need to get into the waters. And Jesus didn't ask him, "Uh, do you need some help to get into the waters? He didn't ask him that. What he did ask him is, do you want to be made whole? Now, there's there's, there's a depth to this question. right? Certainly in the physical realm, the question was, do you want to be healed? But it's much, much, much more than that. You see, if Jesus purpose if he came to heal us physically and bodily he would have been healing everybody but he didn't he didn't for every one person that was healed physically there were probably hundreds and thousands that weren't is that because God can't do it or somehow God is hindered or impotent no that's not the case it's quite clear that the purpose of God in this world is not to heal everybody. And I know there are some people that kind of almost preach that, you know, if you have the right faith and enough faith, you will be healed. And if you're not healed, then there's something wrong with your faith. That's not the purpose of God. That's not to say he doesn't heal. And in this case, it was was going to happen. But remember, this is just the one out of the multitude. He didn't heal the multitude. Sometimes he doesn't deal with the needs of the whole multitude. In the next chapter, he fed the multitude. 
He didn't feed just one, but here he only feed, he heals one. And that's why when he said, well, you may be made whole. See, the question to this man was, was really in the immediate context, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get up and walk? Do you want to get up and walk? But as we move through, it's quite evident that the question is to us as well. Do you want to be made whole? In fact, the hint is there already. Later on, we read in that chapter, um, uh, when he catches up with him, Jesus catches up with him, he says, you've got to stop sinning. Right, lest something worse come. So already there's this question, not only about the physical body, but there's a question about our spiritual well-being, our hearts, our lives. The very thing that makes you, you, which is not these fingers and hands and feet and legs, it's more than that. And so whilst he was going to heal him, when he says, will you be made whole, I'm sure... From God's perspective, there's a depth and a richness in that question that these people miss just at the moment because we just look at the physical plane. And this man says, well, I can't really, unless maybe, maybe he was thinking that Jesus was going to now help him in, you see. Just like I sometimes think maybe God's going to solve my issue by you know, healing this situation or making one of my children well, or enabling them to have children, or whatever. And I think this, this is how I'll resolve the situation. But maybe that's not what God's doing. I'll still pray, but maybe that's not how he's going to do it. Maybe he's not going to put me into the water. Maybe he's got something better. And the better for this man was really, really, it's just short and simple, just the power and the, the settledness and the peace and the authority of Jesus comes in the next verse. He doesn't have to jump up and down. He doesn't have to do anything special. He just says to him, rise up, take up your bed, take up your mat. Right? It's not like the beds that we have. You know, they'd be a bit tough to carry around in our bedrooms. But it was just a kind of a, a, a mat where he could rest upon, take it up and walk. How simple is that? How simple is that? See, disciples are here, I think. It doesn't mention them. But there are people here watching. And so he didn't have to take them into the water, but he, he just said, look, just get up. <laughs> take, your, take your mat and walk. And and he knew this man whose ailment he had carried for 38 years, he felt something. <laughs> he knew something had happened. And immediately, it says, he was made whole. Uh, and s certainly he would have sensed that. <laughs> He's got strength in his legs. He gets up. He takes this mat um, and walks and then think, oh, it's the Sabbath, I better not do this, eh? No, he didn't have to do that. I mean, I think he probably was thinking about other things at that stage. Just when God, have you ever had a burden lifted when God's, or done something in your heart and life? Or well, maybe healed. And, and God does something and you can respond in thankfulness to him and, and you, uh, you probably forget other things. <laughs> and this man just got up, he took his bed and he walked. That, that was the incident, the compassion of Jesus. The compassion for the multitude, certainly there, but the compassion for this man. Uh, and he comes to him and he makes him whole. It's, the job is not finished yet. See? We, we, that's wonderful enough as it is, isn't it? And it is wonderful to see someone who's suffering a debilitating illness somehow be healed. We, all, we long to see that so often. But the story's not finished. Then we come into the conflict. We're probably not going to get much past the conflict today. Uh, this morning, we're going to get further tonight. 
Um, so th- this is this is interesting. Um, it's in, it's interesting that having seen something like this, what would your response be? What would your response be? To this? The, the Pharisees' response here was they didn't care about the man. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? They didn't care about the man. Now, okay, let's say a law was broken. It wasn't, actually, but let's say it was. It was one of their rules was broken. <laughs> one of their rules was broken. We're going to talk about the Sabbath a bit more in a moment. But the Sabbath was completely misunderstood. There's no question about that. And Jesus affirms that it was misunderstood. But one of their rules is... But but, but even even if something like that had happened, you know, and you think, well, maybe this person did maybe something he shouldn't have done, wouldn't there be some sense of, of, of joy that this person was made whole? 38 years? They didn't care. They didn't care one iota for this person. The only thing they could see was a point of criticism of Jesus, which he was going to address, and he was going to address in a way that would would leave them (laughs) angrier, even so. We do the same. We do exactly the same Maybe not about the Sabbath. See, one of the ways that we would have responded here, and we do, is, Jesus, why did you only heal that man? Or why did you not heal my son? Why did you not save my wife? Or my friend? Why did you just pick that? And we see it all the time. My wife has a, a friend uh, who, who she's gotten to know over quite a time. And this, this friend who doesn't believe in God is, is, blames God for allowing this thing to happen to this person. And this thing. So you see what we're doing. Rather than thanking God for what he's done and chosen to do in this man who for 38 years has been ill, we decide to blame God for all the things he didn't do that I think he should. We judge God. I should say we and I misjudge God. And every time... I question God's purposes in this way. What I'm doing is I'm really questioning God. Now I understand that sometimes, you know, we, we can question in a way that's um, that, that's not rebellious. And, and I'm sure if I, I were to lose my wife or she lose me, she may well say, "Why, Lord?" But there's a difference in, in, in expressing a why of faith, if you like, a why of loss, compared to a why of rebellion and judgment, where I put God in the dock and I say, God, you're not doing your job the way you should do it. And, that, and we do that, and, and we mix with more people that do that, don't we? People that will choose every opportunity to blame God for something. (laughs) Ironically, even those that say they don't believe God. Why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he stop this tragedy? What about the rest of that multitude? Why are they sick? If God is real, why aren't they all healed? But you see, we've already had a glimpse earlier on why that's the case you see when we say that what we're doing is is we are limiting ourselves just to the human and physical perspective 
What we're really saying is the thing that matters more than anything in life is this physical frame, is the money we have or the possessions or the material. That's what we're saying. If it were true that that mattered more than anything else, then I guess we'd have a case against God, wouldn't we? But the earth is passing away. The lust thereof. There's an eternity. This man who physically had been ill for 38 years, who is now walking, was going to die bodily. He's been made well now, but that's only a temporary condition. (laughs) Beyond that grave, there's an eternity. If that being the case, wouldn't it make sense? To have that as a priority? The value of the soul? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Jesus said. If that were the case, if I believe that, if I believe that this life is not all there is, if I believe that there is more to life than just the physical and that it is eternal then I can understand why healing some and not others is not the big issue. And we know it, you see. Even unbelievers know it. We know our life consists of more than the abundance of things which we possess. Jesus said that. Take heed and beware of covetousness for, for, for your life consists of more than the things which you... We know that. We know that we can have and be dissatisfied. We know we can have and even have health and wealth and yet have an ache in our hearts because life is not what we would have thought it would be. We know that. And Jesus is just affirming it. You see, there's there's more to you than this outward shell And I've come to seek and to save that which was lost, not the physical frame. Although he's compassionate about our sufferings, but to seek and to save our eternal soul. That's what's on Jesus' mind. That's what's on, on John's mind in presenting the stories because he wants us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and believing we might have life. And that life is eternal life. It's God's life. He wants us to have life. The next part of the uh, chapter, which we're not going to go to just at the moment, but tonight, he, he, his claim is all around his equality with God and his, his life, the fact that he has life. He's the source of life. He's the authority You get life from nowhere else. So he's interested and concerned about life. I mean, we we see um, uh, verse um, 24. Very, very truly, indeed, I say to you, he that hears my word, believes on him that sent me, has everlasting life. Shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. He could see his concern. His concern is a concern of the soul. He didn't say, he that hears uh, um, my word and believes on him that sent me will be healed of his ailments, will be able to take up his mat and walk. He didn't say that. But he did say he could have life. Do you want life? That's what Jesus offers. So one of our responses is to criticise God. It's a response about God. And rather than thanking him for what he's doing, rather than experiencing the blessing of thankfulness, we've got to blame God. Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from that propensity to be critical of our Heavenly Father. 
You know why we do it. There's lots of reason. But I, I think at heart we, we do it because we don't believe that God is good. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his work. Do I believe that God is good? I'm sure this, this person that just got healed probably would say, yes, he's good. <laughs> but, you know, the others that weren't healed, maybe they, they've got second thoughts. It's easy to say God is good when, it, when, when I see the positive blessing of life. But, you see, the reason, the reason I have a criticism of God is because underneath all of this, even though I, I can see what Jesus is doing, do I really believe that he's good? Do I believe that God is good if he allows that adverse circumstance? Or if he allows some difficulty or tragedy to continue? See, it comes back to seeing who he is. Do I believe that he's working all things together for good? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be trite or superficial. I understand there are burdens that weigh heavily on us sometimes. And there are losses that can be heavy. When we say God is believing God is good, it's not about saying, oh, those things don't matter and, oh, your wife died. Oh, don't worry about it. it that, we're, not talk, we're not saying that. What we're saying is a deep-seated in our heart, there's a confidence and a rest. I don't understand it, Lord. I really don't. But I do believe that you're good. And let me tell you, let me tell you the antidote to, to being tempted to think that God is not good. We're going to get there eventually. It's the cross. If you ever, ever doubt or, or, or feel that you're doubting that God is actually good, that he is working things together for good, not only to this man, the one, but to the multitude, if I ever doubt that, I only have to look at the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment for our feet, peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Isn't that a good God? It is a good God. It is a good God. God is good. And when we blame God, and when I blame God in a circumstance, what I'm really saying, I, I just, I don't really believe God could say this to me. He does. You know, I don't think you believe that I'm good. And it's true at times. But God is good. And he's good that he reaffirms it and he's good that he demonstrates it. He's not a, a God that just says, I'm working all things together for good. We can see it and we can see one hanging on a tree in agony and blood on whom my sins and your sins were laid so that he could make this promise that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's good. So this is why... We blame him. There was another response here. And this is, this is more evident later, but the, the Pharisees were critical right, of, of Jesus specifically because he wasn't working within their theological framework. He wasn't doing things the way that they anticipated he should. I guess at least they could have had a, a, a sensible conversation if they genuinely had a concern for the man, <laughs> but they didn't. So this was all excuse, we know that. If, if these people were genuinely concerned about the man and they were trying to weigh up, well, should this be done on the Sabbath or not, you might think, well, at least they're trying to grapple with the truth, but that wasn't the case. They couldn't care. They were interested in their Sabbath law. It was their law, it was not God's law. 
And in that law, there were certain things you could carry and you couldn't carry. Right. And the mat was too big, too heavy. So you weren't allowed to carry that. In fact, it's not only that you weren't allowed to carry that, you, you weren't allowed to heal. And look, I'm sure Robert can give you the technicalities here. Um, there, there were, there, and there were all sorts of technicalities about how much you could do and how much you couldn't do. And, and so they had this framework of what was right, the way you should operate. We would never do that, would we? Remember when Jesus was with his disciples and someone else was ministering in Jesus' name? And the disciples excitedly say, Jesus, we stopped them because <laughs> they're, not, they're not doing it our way here. They must have some other method. They're not with us. And you remember what Jesus said? He, he said that if they're not against me, they're for me. These, these, these people had their own little framework and it was keeping them from a thankfulness for what God is doing. It was keeping them from a, a thankfulness of what God... They should have been saying, isn't it wonderful that not only are devils cast out over here but this other group here in Jesus' name are doing it. Isn't it wonderful that it's spreading? Isn't it wonderful that God is blessing this other congregation over here and they're seeing souls saved? Isn't it wonderful? But sometimes we're inclined to be competitive, aren't we? We think, oh, you know, I wish it was happening here, not over there. I'm guilty. I'm good. It's much easier to get excited about a soul saved when we see them saved here than if it happened somewhere else. Isn't that true? Often. But goodness me, the man's healed. Who cares whether he was healed over there or he was healed here or he was healed over there? It's all part of the work of God and he was healed. Whether he was healed in Cain or Capernaum or he's healed here in Jerusalem, who cares? Why should that be a criticism of the work of God? But all these people could be concerned about is that it wasn't done according to Sabbath law. <laughs> and we can be the same. The Sabbath... Let me just say one or two things and I'll pick up uh, tonight. I'll, I'll say some things maybe a bit controversial and then we'll pick it up tonight. Um, the Sabbath was not all about not working. And Jesus makes this cl clear. In fact, the reason he picks up and says, you know, my father's working and I'm working. His father's working. You mean God's working on the Sabbath? Goodness me, <laughs> I thought we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. See, the, the whole point about the Sabbath, we, we find in Hebrews, in chapter 3 and 4, is that there is a rest, a Sabbath rest, and it's a rest of faith. If my Sabbath, or even my Lord's Day, if it's about not doing certain things, then I've missed everything. The Sabbath rest wasn't just about not doing certain things. It was about the positive rest. And the rest is the rest of faith. If I'm not, whether, it's, whether I have a special day on a Sunday or, or even the concept of the Sabbath here, if these people were not using the Sabbath as a means to, to cultivate their faith, and their rest in God, then they've missed the whole thing. <laughs> it's a Sabbath rest. It's about a positive rest from works. Does that make sense? It's not about not doing the works. So I'm, I'm keeping the Sabbath well if I'm just not, not doing the works. No. It's not about not doing the works. It's about, we, it's about moving from that to this. 
If I just sleep in all day and rest, that's not keeping a Sabbath. I know we're not in the day of the Sabbath now, but, but do you understand what I'm saying? For the Jews to live that way, it wasn't keeping the Sabbath. It was keeping the Sabbath when they moved their attention from those works to someone else. See, and if I haven't moved to the someone else, and if I haven't exercised the faith, then it doesn't matter that I didn't carry my bed (laughs) and my mat. That was meaningless in God's sight. I'm sure I could say that. Because Hebrews affirms that. It's a Sabbath rest of faith. So, we come to the close for now. We've seen Jesus healed. We've seen he's healed one man, not the multitude. We've seen that God is good nevertheless because he knows what he's about. We've seen something of the criticism that we level of God because we, we think he should be working in a particular way. But we're encouraged to see Jesus and we're encouraged to rest in him by faith to rest in him by faith let's pray Heavenly Father we're grateful for your word we're we're grateful just to be able to to know and to be called the children of God Uh, something which we we never earned which we don't deserve And daily, we we want to learn to be a thankful people with a thankful spirit to acknowledge who you are and bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.